Hey everyone, I'm Amanda Dow, Dad in the Common Thread pod podcast in the Howard Thurman Center. My name is Greg Wilson. My name is Tarif Ahmed, and we're joined by two very special guests. We have Ileana Tauscher and Trish Garrity. They're going to be talking about sexuality today, so we're very excited. We are. Now, we like this topic because it sort of segues in from dating culture, which we talked about last time, and now we're sort of getting into the meat of the issue, the which nitty -gritty. is... nitty-gritty. We're college students. There's a whole conversation about sexuality. So, in the spirit of this, Trish, why don't you introduce the vagina monologues? What which, are they? Which are opening this weekend. Yes, they are. So, thank you guys so much for having us. And I love this topic, and I especially love talking about vagina monologues. So, um, the vagina monologues is run through the Athena's Players, which is a student group here on campus. Um, and we are a women's collective that believes in ending violence against women through theater and activism. So every year for the past six, we've done the Vagina Monologues here on campus. And the Vagina Monologues um, was originally, it's written and put together by Eve Ensler, who's our playwright, and she did a series of vagina interviews, and through that grew into the Vagina Monologues. And originally it was a one-woman show in New York, and one of her friends came up to her and said, hey, you know, there's... There's a lot to this. Like, you could get more people involved in this. Like, this could be a much bigger deal than just you on a stage. And she kind of thought of it, expanded it, and that is how the V-Day movement was born. Um, and V-Day is a organization that is working to end violence against women uh, nationally and internationally. And every year they pick a spotlight around the world that... Eve believes and V-Day believes needs our special attention, needs our help. So for the past two years, it's been the women and girls of Haiti, and we're very proud to be mm -hmm. supporting V-Day's work there. And um, we also, a portion of that, will be also be going to help women in the DRC. Um, part of the rules with doing a production of the Vagina Monologues is that you have to do it during V-Season, which is essentially February. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, half of your proceeds go back to V-Day. You don't have to pay for the rights or anything for the play. Half proceeds go to V-Day and half your proceeds need to go to an organization in your neighborhood that is actively working to end violence against women and girls. So our proceeds this year will be going towards the Boston Area Rape Crisis Center, or BARC, which is a phenomenal organization in our neighborhood that provides a 24-hour hotline, informational services, um, medical advocacy. Uh, it's really just a phenomenal organization that's really working to help all people in our neighborhood deal with sexual assault and issues that come along with that. Now, the Vagina Monologues deals with a lot of sometimes taboo topics of, you know, female sexuality, menstruation, masturbation. So can you, can we talk a little bit about that? Because I don't feel like it, these topics are necessarily talked about enough. Absolutely. And even before we do that, I'm just going to say, you know, what Trish said is the sort of, you know, the purpose behind this. Don't let the seriousness of what she said deter you from going. This yeah. is a hilarious Yeah, show. I had a great Sorry. time. <laughs> yeah. One thing I was going to say, although I, I wasn't able to make it last year, but okay. based off what people said, it's these are very serious topics that you're talking about, but you present them in sort of a light way that get the conversation going, yeah. which is probably the most important part about it. So... Want to so, sort of explain yeah, I guess going off of that, um, so like I said, it was originally done out of vagina interviews and they became vagina monologues. So every monologue, we like to say that it's not just about the vagina. Um, it's about the female experience and all different facets that that can fall into. So yes, we do have a monologue that, um, you know, is a taboo topic because it's all about reclaiming the word cunt, which is something that people don't really like to talk about. but. It's an issue. It relates to the female experience. Um, there are some on sexual abuse, which is a very important topic. And then we have some that are, you know, I'm angry. I'm angry that I have to wear thong underwear. What's up with that? <laughs> um, it's hilarious. Um, it's serious. It's emotional. Um, but overall, it gets a conversation going. And uh, what really got me... Uh, involved in BU is when I saw it sophomore year, I left after seeing a few of my friends perform and I was with three of my friends and we were like walking down Bay State <laughs> and we're all really quiet and no one's really saying anything. After the show? After the show. We had just left. It was night. We're walking down Bay State <laughs> and one of my friends just goes, can we just talk about our vaginas, please? I just want to talk about it. And we were like, yes. So we like went back to our room, sat down and just had the most wonderful, inspiring conversation about our vaginas, about how we felt about them, how we look at them, how we, what they smell like, like all sorts of things that may, like you said, Amanda, come off as taboo, but mm -hmm. you know, the point of the show is to kind of debunk that taboo because there's no reason that, 
you know, on one half, females are completely objectified and sexualized, and on the other half, our sexuality is so closeted and so put away, which is just but something so I found, frustrating. I found really remarkable about uh, vagina monologues. I went last year for the first time, and um, it's not so much that these are taboo topics, it's, it's the discomfort that people sometimes have, mm -hmm. um, and especially women, and that to me is very, I don't really understand that. I've always been very open about sexuality, and... Um, to hear my friends who are who are girls say, you know, like, oh, I, I can't talk about masturbation. It's just so embarrassing, or I can't just I can't talk about these things. Or like menstruation, it just doesn't really make sense to me because it's it's your body, and and there's such shame in it sometimes, and I mm -hmm. think that's really the sad yep. thing. I want to talk a little bit about where that shame comes from because I have noticed that how you're raised has a lot to do with it, and you know, I think what your parents teach you about sexuality and being comfortable with it. I personally, you know, my mom was always very, very open with me and, you know, talking about sex or anything like that was not a big deal in my house. But I think I was in the minority. I mean, I don't know. What do you guys think? I think you're in the minority. Yeah. 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 I do think I'm in the minority. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know what it's like to grow up, you know, where that is uncomfortable, but... I saw it with my friends, and I, I do think it had kind of a negative effect on them, you know? I mean... Absolutely. I mean, a lot of it is cultural, right? You'll see a lot of, uh, especially immigrant families that don't talk about those types of things. I was lucky. My parents were very progressive. Well, my parents, my mom was very progressive, so mm -hmm. she, whole, like, you know, sat me down and gave me the whole spiel when I turned, like, 13, 14. She's like, yeah, okay, this is what's going to happen. Body's gonna change. This is what's uh, up. <laughs> don't get <laughs> so, scared. Don't be scared. Like, here's how you deal with it dad didn't do that. All my dad did was when I turned 17, he just walked into my room and said, if you get someone pregnant, you're on your own. <laughs> and he walked out. So I was like, yes, sir. Like, not happening. Now, just to clarify for the listeners, Tariq, your family... is from Bangladesh. My okay. parents immigrated when I was just one and a half years old uh, to this country. What about, like, do you think that it's only an immigrant thing? or do you It's think not just no. an immigrant thing, but I feel like they have... Because in Bengali culture, or let's say Islamic culture, to mm -hmm. be really broad, you can't even talk about that like at all, like zero like you can't even talk about kissing really mm -hmm. and so there's like that layer they have to get over and then they come here and then we're figuring out that you know American culture which they think is so promiscuous mm -hmm. even in this culture we can't talk openly yeah. about sexuality now do you think that's more based in culture or is it religion type thing because I think I, th I would say it's personally religion because I think it's something that when you talk about it starts to it, it starts to get at a lot of the institutions of a lot of organized religions. So nobody really wants to bring it up because then you have to address other issues of organized religions. So it's just something that we sort of not necessarily sweep under the rug, but if you just ignore it. It's the elephant in the room that if you ignore, you don't have a, you can avoid a lot of other right. issues yeah. to talk about. So, I mean, I think that's why we didn't really talk about it in my house. But I went to a Quaker school all throughout high school and... Quakerism, while that's an organized religion, it's very free form. It doesn't have many like concrete beliefs and institutions. Therefore, it allows for those types of open conversations. And it's not trying to come up with a particular conclusion about these things, but rather just allow everybody to have an opinion about it. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, once I got to college, people were more open. And, and yet, apparently, it's just not enough. Like, there isn't that dialogue that goes on. Uh, and, you know, through vagina monologues, you see that for the women's side. And on the male side, like, any conversation about sexuality is a meathead, chest-thumping experience where which gorilla has the biggest, like, muscles, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's always bragging. There's no real substance to the conversation. It's, oh, yeah, I slept with that girl, or this well, night just railed that girl. I haven't seen a bunch of dudes sitting down and having, like, a real conversation. It's like, oh, man, I just can't get it up this morning. Like, I don't know what to do anymore. Like, <laughs> do I need Viagra? Like, no, those don't happen. Mm -hmm. You keep that to the side. You're taught to keep it to the side because you don't want to be weak. Yeah, and I think that men, and I don't want to make any blanket statements, but I'll just say it, men, I think, have been conditioned to, to, to that mindset almost. They have to be. They can't talk about sex maybe in an emotional way or sexuality in an emotional sense because then they're seen as weak somehow um, and then again I found that I have had conversations with guys about sexuality that aren't um, necessarily about you know what you were saying chest thumping yeah oh. chest thumping. <laughs> I don't know I mean I do think that it's definitely insecurity I think boys are conditioned in our society to be you know tough and you know 
girls are not. I feel like girls are just more made to feel uncomfortable. Submissive. Submissive. That's a good word, Anna. Yeah. <laughs> it's just weird that people repress sexuality because this is the one thing that almost... Everyone has... I mean, in general, yes. Like, most people reproduce. Or is that... It, it, am I wrong in saying that? Oh, no. I, I, want, I want to speak to that. Sometimes. Okay, yeah. Most yeah. people do... Like, we all got here. We all have something to say. Two people had sex and gave birth, like, and, and your mom gave birth to you. So, like, yes, you're a product of sex. And you have impulses to have sex. Jump in, Trish. Yeah. So, I've actually, I've been doing a lot of reflecting on this recently. Um, and, and, and I think also, I mean, when you're in vagina monologues, I would, you know, this is a complete shout out. But if next year, audition for the show if you haven't, because it's it's not just being in a play. It's, it's a whole, whole experience. Um... But something I've been thinking about a lot is is our sexual selves and how we will pay people thousands of dollars to sit in therapy and have people help us with our mental selves and become concrete in who we are mentally and what makes us comfortable and what triggers us and what where are we. Like those things that we we go to someone else for. We spend hundreds of dollars on gym memberships to improve our physical selves so we feel better physically. What do we do for our sexual selves? How are we taught to be sexual? How are we taught to perceive our sexual selves? I, I personally don't think we are. Um, and it's something that, that really frustrates me because I think there's so much, like you were saying, Tarif, like everyone, everyone is born because of the act, for the most part, because of the act of sex. Why don't we talk about it more? And why is it that it's only the action of the verb, but instead of an identity, and instead of just not even feeling the need to conform to, conform to one word, but exploring, this is what I'm comfortable with, you know, this is what I like, this is, you know, how I feel about, you know, what's between my legs, or, you know, the mindset that comes with that. And I, I just hope that a play like this and, you know, can help people get conversing about what what that is. Um, we had a really beautiful experience happen um, on Tuesday. Uh, we've been tabling in the link and this mother and her two girls, they, I think one was like, I'd say around like seven and four, um, they walked by the table and the mom turned them, looked at us and they all went, yay vaginas! <laughs> And it was like a part of my heart just <laughs> leapt, and I was so happy, and I was like, yes, best mom ever. Mm -hmm. And then they came back to the table like an hour later, and they were like, oh, we can't go to the show, but, you know, we, we want to buy some of your buttons. So they're looking at the buttons, and the four-year-old goes, mommy, what's this one? And she points to one of the buttons we sell, and it says cunt. And she says that that, that button says cunt, and the little girl goes, what's that? And the mom says... It's another word for your vagina. You can proudly wear that at home, but you can't wear that to school. Would you like to buy that one? And the little girl kind of looked at it, and she was like, I don't like red. And then she like went and got the pink one that says, Peace, Love, Vagina. And then the mom the two girls both got matching ones, and then they got one for their dad. And it was just the most beautiful moment because you could tell that this mother just had such an open mind and that she was sharing that and allowing her daughters to be open in that way. And it was one of those moments where I was like, yeah, I'm going to raise my kids like that. Like, yes, you're proving it. Like, you're proving that you can raise your kids to have that mindset. And yeah. Props to that mom. I mean, you know what it kind of reminds me of? You guys all know the song Daughters by John Mayer? Mm -hmm. Yes. And the, 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 you don't know that song? I've got to go home and listen to that song. But the, my favorite line in it is, um, girls become lovers who turn into mothers. And it's all about, you know, how your your parents shape you because you're gonna be with someone and then you're gonna you're gonna have kids of your own. I mean I feel as and I'm in this is a bold statement because I know a lot of parents don't do this. Uh, if you're not teaching your children about sexuality, you're doing them a great disservice because that is a huge part of their identity when they grow up. And if they're going into that Blindly. you know world without knowing and then everyone else is, they're not gonna know what to do. They're gonna be very confused. I agree. And, and I think that comes with a level of confidence, too. Like, you as a parent need to have that confidence and that comfort with the subject yourself to pass it on to your children. And growing up from that, I think you will have just this greater self-respect. You'll treat yourself better. You probably will be safer sexually. Um, again, bold statements, big theories. But I really think that by talking about sexuality and not just like the act of sex, but you know, living a sexual life and having that be a part of who you are, not something that you know is the elephant in the room, mm -hmm. like you said. Um, I think that comes with a great power. 
that you're giving your children. So that's sort of a generational thing. I mean, <clears throat> we're the generation that's sort of having that discussion a lot. Yeah. So clearly, our children are going to have sort of a more sense of comfort with it because we're going to have something to say about it. But I guess I wouldn't even, I mean, the, the people who are having children now, these are 30 year olds, 20, early upper 20 year olds, I guess they're not really having that conversation yet. So we're not seeing it. But I mean, it's hopeful for the future because we're sitting oh, here having this conversation. Now, what do you guys feel like? There's this word sexuality, right? And it contributes to our identity. But how does it do that? I mean, maybe for you guys personally, if you want to talk about that, like, how does the idea of you being a heterosexual male or, or bisexual or homosexual, how does that contribute to your identity? You know, Eliana, I want to hear about you from that, because you do a lot of work with the LGBT community right. on campus, and I feel like how you identify sexually has a lot to do with how you present yourself and how you feel about yourself. Yeah, you know, that's a really, it's a hard question to answer, because, especially for me, because for a long time, um, sexuality, which is what I learned from my parents, is it's a very private thing. It's not something that you go around and you, and you just talk about very openly. Um, it's okay, um, like when I came out, um, as a lesbian, I guess three years ago, my my parents were just like, you know, we support you, but but keep it to yourself for now. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, okay, um, that's fine. But then I, I found that that sort of it's destructive because it teaches you that um, there's something shameful again. Mm -hmm. Again, this word shame comes up. A lot of times when I when I work with people who identify as LGBTQ. Um, their sexual identity is almost a hindrance because it's, it's again, so personal. It's, it's really hard for people to, I don't know, act, I guess. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, uh, it's, it's a difficult question. It is a difficult yeah. question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think what it does is that there's these things that have been just laid out uh, by society. So your sexuality, I, mean, I don't even need to talk. There's so many things. First of all, before I even start talking, there's so many terms in regards to this whole topic that are so complex and are so... And as we learned from this past weekend, they're so particular that mm -hmm. it's hard to talk about it because I feel like in one way I might be using half the terms wrong. Mm. But um, when it comes to, I'm going to say gender, and I don't know if that's the right word again, mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's male, female, and I think these lay, they lay down sort of this life that you can live. So when it, it's so important because, our, to us, we think it's so important because the things, that you, the, the things that define a male are sort of the way that you live your life, so these are things that you have to do. I don't even know where I'm going anymore because it's so complex. Ask your right, question exactly. again. Ask your question again. You know, no. wait, just to clarify real quick, um, the weekend that Greg and I, Greg mm. was talking about, Greg, Ileana, and I went on a retreat about gender and sexuality through the Posse Foundation here at BU. It's a great foundation that gives um, full tuition scholarships, but they do a retreat every year, and this year we talked all about gender and sexuality. So that definitely helped inspire mm -hmm. the theme today. Um, you know what I'm curious about? I... F I you know, there's this idea that there's a spectrum of sexuality, that no one is completely straight or completely gay, like if it's a number scale from 1 to 10, that everybody falls somewhere in the middle. Maybe you're more straight, maybe you're more gay, maybe you're exactly in the middle and you're bisexual. And I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with that or disagree. What do you, what do you guys think about that? Well, I mean, I think, I think there is something to be said about nobody being 100% straight or 100% gay. Um, whether you're willing to tap into that, I think, is another thing, and whether you're aware enough of sort of those, maybe... I mean, that's a hard concept to grasp, because what does it mean to be, like, closer to, this, to the straight side? Exactly. Yeah. What because, does that even mean? Because if, if maybe, maybe you identify as a heterosexual and you only ever have heterosexual partners your entire life, um, what does it mean that maybe one day somebody comes along who's the same sex? Exactly. What do you yeah. do? Does that... Exactly. And that's where I think the danger lies sometimes in labeling sexualities. Mm -hmm. um, it can give a lot of comfort to people because it, it gives them a sense of community, but it can also be really isolating. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, I completely agree. And I definitely think that obviously like the scale and the spectrum, um, you know, I think it helps us almost understand and, you know, see it as almost like an education tool. But I think, you know, you can't quantify or even qualify, in my opinion, like what you are, how you feel sexually. I think it's so much, I think it should be so much of a personal exploration and so much of a, you know, 
I, I agree. I just, I can't stand sexual labels. And I understand mm -hmm. that the power they give people, like, that's who am I to judge that. Um, how you identify is how you identify. And the community can be very beautiful and very, very helpful. Um, but I feel as though what you were almost talking about before is when you... Ex when you when you join that community or you actively live in one like the male sphere or the or the female <coughs> role, um, you know there's there's a culture and there's there's not even a culture there's expectation mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. comes with it and if you suddenly you know halfway down the path are like hmm how I feel about a lot of these expectations. Mm -hmm. I don't really agree with, you know, how people are looking at me or how people are, you know, choose to talk to me. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's where it gets the most confining and the most difficult because then you you need you feel the need the need to break free. And if we continue to kind of like push labels, I don't. I think we're we're just gonna have a new generation of stifling that mm -hmm. comes out. Well, it's very interesting for me. I wasn't, you know, when I grew up in high school, my school wasn't very um, diverse in terms of people's sexuality. It, we had a few kids who were openly gay, but uh, they really kept to themselves and we didn't mingle with them too much. And so uh, I wasn't aware about, you know, all of these issues that people face regarding their sexuality, like the fact that they have to figure out what their identity is and how they fit in with others. Um, even just recently, I became aware, I was just thinking about it and talking to a friend of mine who was gay and... The fact is, I'm at college, and it's very easy for me to, you know, find people to date and talk. But when you have that, uh, you know, let's that identity crisis where you're trying to figure out what is your identity, it's so much harder to find someone else who's on the same page with you if they're ever going to be on that same page. And then I think it, was I talking to you about this? I feel uh, like it was you because <laughs> we have a lot of these talks. <laughs> we do have these songs. Um, they're like an 80 year gap or sorry a 60 year gap between uh this 82 year old woman and her like 20 year old mm -hmm. boyfriend and i was just you know <laughs> you don't see that normally unless it's a really rich businessman taking advantage of a young girl mm -hmm. but you know those are serious issues that people deal with and you're just not aware of them unless you know someone who's who's in that world and you know af after i figured out that type of struggle, I'm a lot more sympathetic to it, and it is become an issue that I care about as opposed to something that I just mm -hmm. ignore, you know. Yeah, well, I think with that conversation, we were talking a little bit about how it's your life experience makes it really difficult sometimes to find a partner, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and where you are in your life makes it really difficult to find a partner, um, and especially with with people who are struggling with their sexuality, you don't want to bring a lot of emotional baggage to a relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. But that isn't that isn't you know necessarily it's not just gay people or just LGBTQ yeah. or I, I think that really goes for everybody. There's sure there's a smaller pool if you're trying to date. Um, but again, I think these are all sort of universal. But I think going off of that, um, and again, I wasn't a part of this conversation, so I don't know all the nitty gritty. <laughs> but um, you know those issues that come up in relationships, odds are like. Yes, a lot of them can be culturally and socially imposed, especially if, you know, you're a kind of couple, you know, an 80-year-old woman and a 20-year-old man, you know, a couple that isn't um, seen often or out often or anything, or, you know, isn't culturally whatever accepted or usual, whatever that means. Um, I think that then falls into this problem of how much does that affect relationships and, you know, different quote-unquote relationships um, and then how much of it is just your connection with the other person and I think a lot of conversations that I have about sexuality often go back to well if you know I, I fall in love with a person not their gender mm -hmm. not their mm -hmm. age not what's between their legs mm -hmm. it's who they are it's how they live that's something that often plays into well then how do you view relationships and how do you view that kind of sharing system and support system that comes with that and I do think that's when you have the issues that I was talking about before of like cultural and social expectations that play in on how you're able to be with another person um <clears throat> one thing that we've been sort of talking about a lot recently which is sort of it sort of uh, touches on that sphere of dealing in relationships is the whole idea of gender roles mm -hmm. and we we spoke about it this past weekend once again the whole spectrum there's the the, the male, female, but 
no one necessarily lies to the ends of those of, the, of those of those points, and everyone's sort of in between. What are your opinions about sort of gender roles and how society creates them? And just sort of talk about that kind of stuff. I feel like you have a lot to say about that. Ooh, uh, gender roles. Um, so um, I was raised by two feminists mm -hmm. um, who taught me that there was nothing that my biology could keep me from doing. Mm -hmm. um, and that plays into sex, I know, which is different than gender. Mm -hmm. um, but I do, I do identify as female. Um, with the female gender, uh, I think I study anthropology and I study a lot of um, gender in uh, conflict and how gender violence permeates in conflict and something that I've seen a lot when I've studied it abroad and now that I look in every community now that I'm in is um, how we reaffirm each other's gender roles. Mm. Um, the terms we use to address each other, how we even text one another, mm. you know, you know, do you, when you, when you're texting your quote unquote male friends, you just say, hey, or do you say like, hey, let, hey love, or like, you know, the, like, the language mm -hmm. we use towards one another and how that permeates that divide. Um, I also think, you know, even going just to like the clothing we wear, um, our hairstyles, you know, all of those things fall into a lot of expectation. And I think that resonates with this idea of gender roles. And I think it also goes back to what we're taught as children and how we see our parents' roles. And as I said, I was raised by two feminists who were very equal and they're both educators and seeing that it was always a partnership. It was always equal. Um, my mother is a huge human rights activist around particularly women's rights and education and seeing, having the education of we're raising you in this household that everyone's equal, but you should be aware that on the outside, it's not like that's it. not always how it is, and mm -hmm. you need to be prepared for that. So, yes, as I said, I identify as female. I love being a woman. I love being female. Um, and I'm confident in saying that. But at the same time, I don't like a lot of the social and cultural repercussions that come with that gender role. Okay, so this is sort of more for the whole table. <clears throat> if you say that you're identifying as a woman, mm -hmm. what are you what are you identifying with? Is that simply, like you sort of mentioned earlier, a biological thing? Like I was born as a woman, so I'm going to accept that. Are you uh, accepting the? What are you accepting when you say identify as a woman? Are you accepting everything that sort of comes with that as far as the gender roles that exist now? Well, no, I I don't think it's identifying necessarily with gender roles mm -hmm. because, like Trisha saying, um, similarly, I was raised by two people who are very who are feminists um, and so they never taught me that there were limitations based on my gender but I think that when people have a gender identity it's more a physical mm -hmm. thing that they're comfortable mm -hmm. in their skin is sort of the, the phrase you would hear and so people who may be born a, a male or a female and then who identifies the opposite gender they, they just have this profound sense of discomfort they, they just don't feel like they're in the right body and they don't feel like who they are matches what they project outwardly. Mm -hmm. Is now, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but I think like, I'm still a little confused as to when you say that, is it like, all right, I'm a male biologically, mm -hmm. but when I identify, say I identify as a female, does that mean, I mean, does that mean like I'm a, I'm sort of subscribing to the things that we, as a society expect from females and I sort of think that's the way I am playing into that I think it's just as you would associate with a culture it's that idea of like a shared history a shared um, present condition um, you know a set of norms like when I say I'm when I say I'm Catholic that mm -hmm. comes with a whole mm -hmm. history and that, that you know that I believe X Y and Z mm -hmm. I do this but just as I say I'm Catholic there are a lot of things I don't agree with that the church does. There are a lot of things that I don't agree with with certain subjects. I think, again, it goes back to that idea of like these labels mm -hmm. and having the freedom to show our variety within our own labels. Mm -hmm. That, yes, gender roles can then be empowering, and I accept, you know, I the female history, the female position, and the implications that come with it, but I don't necessarily agree with how I've been cast. Okay. That, that, that gives more clarification. You know what, I think that a lot of it is 
I mean, gender roles can be so complicated because it's the idea that you're identifying, are you identifying with stereotypes, with what society expects of you? And I think that, yeah, maybe sometimes that's true. Like, I am a woman, and am I sometimes girly and, and really feminine? Absolutely. But I don't think it's necessarily 100% that way. Okay. Have to jump in here. Unfortunately, the lovely Trish Garrity has to go because Vagina Monologues is tonight. Would you want to give a shout out to yes, uh, what it's showing? I do. Tonight at Psy at 7 p.m. will be our opening performance. Um, tickets are on sale for ten dollars. Um, tomorrow night or tomorrow we have two shows. One at 2 p.m. which will be ASL interpreted, and then one at 7 p.m. which will be our closing show. Again, tickets are ten dollars. Three opportunities. We have buttons. We have T-shirts, and all. All of our proceeds are either going towards the V-Day movement or towards the Boston Area Rape Crisis Center. Um, there also will be an activism expo at each performance where um, different groups on our campus, different student organizations, but then also different Boston um, organizations will be coming talking about how they're actively working to change the issues that the show presents. Well, I am personally very, very excited. I can't wait to see the show. Everybody listening should go see the show. Trish, thank you so much for thank coming you. on. Thank we're you gonna for be talking, having me. We're going to be talking for a few more minutes, but Trish, loved <coughs> having you. Great Please conversation. Back. Please you, come back. You are welcome back anytime. Awesome. But well, you should come to the Coffee and Convo because we're going to be talking about sex. We are. Coffee and Convo at 3 o'clock today in the HTC <coughs> is all about sex. How about that? You like that? Bye, Trish. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. So, getting back to this conversation of sexuality. Well, um, let's, let's, let's stay on gender roles for a few moments. Oh, I'm sorry. We were on gender roles. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's I mean, really it's all tied together. Because yeah. when you think about it, right, who are the people you aspire to be, right? Who are your role models? And not that being a male prevents me from respecting a lot of the great women that have done a lot for the world, but none of my, like, role models or people I tried to be like were female. Mm -hmm. I always looked towards another guy and was like, yeah, that man, he's a real man. Like, he's doing things the way I want to be. Yeah. And so I emulate them. Is that true for you guys, too, or am I alone? In no, I, I will say that I am very, very close to my mom and that I've had a very strong, very, very strong female role model my entire life. And I do think that that plays into how I identify myself because I do identify as a woman, but like as a subcategory, as my mother's daughter. Mm -hmm. That's very critical to how I think of myself. So would it be weird if I were to go and someone said, hey, Greg, who inspires you the most? Mm -hmm. And I said somebody like, oh, Michelle Obama. Would everyone look at me strangely like, mm, why is that? What? I feel like they slightly would. Yeah, I feel like they would. Yeah, and and that on the surface strikes me as wrong. Like we shouldn't feel that way, but mm -hmm. then it almost makes sense. Which then I feel really bad about saying that mm -hmm. too. So I don't know. I'm very yeah. confused. Yeah. No. Whereas if I were to say, you know, I I really admire Barack Obama, that's not an issue right. at yeah. all. And yeah. and that's also a very interesting thing, um, where women are almost sometimes allowed more to have those male role models. And men aren't. Yeah, Jeez. tomboys are cute, right? Uh -huh. But if your little son tries to wear a ballet dress, like mm -hmm. you have right. a crisis going on in which your was, household usually. Which yeah. is one thing I was going to bring up earlier. As far as this spectrum, I think we're in a society now where females can sort of lay across the entire spectrum. You can, they can display male character, male characteristics. <laughs> I'm doing the air quotes, um, and it's completely cool. You're like, oh, yeah, she's a strong woman. But then if you, if if a man is on the other side of the spectrum and he's displaying quote unquote female characteristics we don't we don't say oh it's such a nice we, we, we say weird things we, we tend to start questioning that person and somehow it's 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 not as accepted you know what I wonder I wonder if being uncomfortable with those kind of gender roles with like say a, a male being feminine I kind of wonder if that relates back to sexuality and being people being uncomfortable with the labels of sexuality like oh my gosh is my son gay mm -hmm. you know and I and what you're saying how like you ha if you have a daughter who's a tomboy it's not as big of a deal but if you have a son who's feminine crisis mm -hmm. you know and I kind of I wonder if people are more uncomfortable with gay men than gay women I think they are 100% yeah I think right now in society we, de we define male characteristics are sort of strong characteristics and female characteristics is weaker ones. Mm -hmm. So when a when a female identifies more towards those male ones, it's not a problem because strength is always good. But then when a male is going over there to what we think is a weaker side, then we're upset. 
Which is what's so messed up. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you, you associate feminine with, with yeah. negative characteristics, and mm -hmm. why is that the case? Why, why, would it, why is it a bad thing for a guy to say, I'm a feminine guy? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. You have to rationalize it. You have to you say, have you know, I have these it. feminine characteristics, but look, they contribute towards my masculinity in this way. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you can't. You can't be like a sensitive guy unless, oh, I'm sensitive, but I'm an artist, and you know, through my art, I make a lot of money, and that's why I'm rich and powerful. Right? You need to have that connection. <laughs> that's, why, that's, why, that's why Kanye West can be all crazy and mm -hmm. artsy, because yeah, look at me, I'm Kanye West. Look mm -hmm. at how I dress. Look how much money I have. Mm -hmm. Right? If Kanye West was just like being artsy in the corner by himself, like he'd probably get made fun of. Mm -hmm. And right there I made a huge jump by like associating artsy with feminine and mm -hmm. negative like see how, like we're just conditioned to do it right away and like I think you catch on the more you think about it but so how do we uncondition ourselves oh god the other question is should we uncondition ourselves that's I another mean, thing what this does play a, a function in, in our society right and as an anthropologist I can uh, I can tell you different societies have different ideas for what is accepted and behaviors that reinforce that our society is sort of this conglomerate of everything, so we, we have a lot more of an identity crisis. Do we want to deconstruct this? That's the whole point of sociology, right? De deconstructing the binary, mm -hmm. that's what they say. What happens at that point? Can you rebuild a binary that's completely uh, equal for everyone? I don't think you can. I yeah. think you just get another layer of you know people being forced into boxes they don't necessarily agree with. Mm -hmm. Well, but I think that you should, because I think what ends up happening is that you teach people then intolerance towards other, other people. So mm -hmm. so people who don't necessarily fall into those boxes um, are ostracized. And I think then you perpetuate this mindset that men should act like men, women should act like women, and there should be no shades of gray. And unless you start challenging those concepts, yeah, it's okay. Don't challenge it in yourself, maybe if you do feel really comfortable, but don't then go out and sort of dictate to, the, to everyone else mm -hmm. that this is how things should be. Because it's really stifling and it's really dangerous. And, mm -hmm. it, and it leads, it, it makes people depressed. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really sad thing when you, when you meet somebody who is having a real struggle with their you know, sexual identity or their gender identity. I think that's where we come back to labels, where it can be very dangerous to label others or to argue with how somebody identifies themselves. But, you know, should we necessarily get rid of labels or those boxes? I don't necessarily think so, because I think that some people take comfort in I know I do. I take comfort in identifying as a woman, you know? Society's been sort of working like that for however long you can remember, so like, if it's not broke, don't fix it, type thing. If if we've been working as a society by men acting like men and women acting like women and we've been successful in that way, possibly something bad could happen if we were to take that idea away. But I do see the need to take away that idea of what, what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman because technically they make no sense. I, I mean, I'm not claiming to have the answer. What I've found that helps me is just recognizing when I've been conditioned to think a certain way and just acknowledging that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not gonna change who I am just because it's a product of social conditioning. Mm -hmm. I kind of like who I am and I'm lucky in that I can be comfortable in my exactly. skin and no one's gonna challenge that. Um, but just being aware, like, yeah, when I make that comment about, you know, what my little cousin's doing just because I think he's being really girly, right, that is conditioning and acknowledge that. And if he happens to be gay, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Mm -hmm. But um, what say you, Eliana? Well, no, I agree with um, what you're saying. Uh, if you're comfortable enough in your own skin, then that's one thing, but a lot of people aren't, and then that's as a result when the judgment comes. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we have to teach people to be accepting of themselves, mm -hmm. and I think once you have that self-acceptance, then you can sort of move forward and accept everybody else. But mm -hmm. it, it takes a lot of work for self-acceptance, and it takes a lot of... Um, a lot of guidance, I guess. You, you need good role models, and you need people to talk to, and you need resources. Um, and, and you can't sort of put away these things, these topics, and as if they're taboo, because they're not. They're, it's something that everybody deals with on a daily basis, mm -hmm. especially yeah. now, especially when we're in our you know early yeah. 20s. As we're wrapping up, um, you talked about you know you need that support. Uh, we, we do have a place on campus where you can go, so do you want to tell uh, the listeners about this? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a, the Center for Gender, Sexuality, and Activism located right next to the Howard Thurman Center. Um, they're a great resource for um, anyone, really. Um, and then there's a few groups on campus, too. There's Queer Activist Collective. We meet um, Fridays at 4 in the CGSA. 
and um, there's also Spectrum, and there's also Outlook. So those are three great resources that are available to BU students. Well, Ileana, thank you so much for coming uh, coming on today. We really appreciate it. Great thank conversation. Thank you. Thanks for having me. A couple of quick shout-outs. Uh, Julian Jensen, the fabulous Julian Jensen, who is a student ambassador down in HTC but is abroad, did the logo for our podcast, and we are currently working on putting that up on the website. So special thanks to him. And we also have an email now. We have an email, you guys. We have an email. Official. So so if you want to email us, if you want to comment, if you want to give us ideas, Keep the feedback, conversation going. yeah, yes. get in touch with us. Please it's, send questions. Please. It's the common thread podcast at gmail.com. That's all spelled out, the common thread podcast at gmail.com. Also, special thanks to Adam Evan Engel. He's our tech guy. He keeps us sane. He puts stuff up on iTunes. We are going to be on iTunes. How about that? Download us and walk around campus listening to our wonderful voices. I know, right? And next week... We're going to be talking about something kind of controversial. Next week's a heavy one. We're going to be talking about Israel and Palestine in mm. uh, honor of Israel Peace Week. Uh, I don't know if people noticed, the uh, BU Israel Club uh, was in the GSU link with a lot of their information this week and a counter-protest. The Students for Justice in Palestine were sitting right across from them uh, with their message. And so there is that tension, and we'd like to talk about it. So. We're going to solve it, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> it's all going to go down right here in the MLK room right. in the so Howard Thurman questions, Center. Questions, concerns, or things you'd want to see us talk about, please email them. Please Amanda, do. what's that email address one more time? It's the common thread podcast at gmail.com. Thank you. Well, so come on down and see us. We are at the Howard Thurman Center down in the GSU. Go to Center for Gender, Sexuality, and Activism. See Ileana. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Amanda. I'm Greg. I'm Tariq. And thank you to Ileana for coming on. Thanks. We'll see you next.